Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to today's United Nations High Level Political Forum side event entitled Beyond the Rhetoric, on Leaving No One Behind, Concrete Policies and Actions to Eliminate Systemic Racism in Implementation of the SDGs. My name is Anila Balthasun and I'm the Executive Director of the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues or SPICI. I wanna give you just a little background about SPICI. We were founded in 1936 and we're an organization of psychologists and other social scientists interested in the application of research and action to improve policymaking and, and particularly using evidence-based science findings to do so. As it relates to today's event, we've had a very long and distinguished history in addressing racism, prejudice and discrimination and other human rights issues through the work of our members. Since 1987, SPICI has been affiliated with the UN in New York and Geneva, where its representatives seek to bring psychological and social science perspectives to bear on a range of global issues, including racism, women and gender, children's rights, aging, climate and environment, health, mental health, and psychosocial resilience, migration, and more recently, the United Nations 2030 SDGs agenda. SPICI holds special accreditation status with the UN ECOSOC or Economic and Social Council. We are currently headquartered in Washington, DC. Today's event was organized by SPICI's NGO team at the United Nations, and I wanna give them a big thank you for their efforts. Today's event is co-sponsored by the permanent mission of Costa Rica in part, and in partnership with the following NGOs having consultative status with ECOSOC. ATOP Meaningful World, European Health Society, sorry, European Health Psychology Society, International Association for Applied Psychology, Psychology Coalition of NGOs having consultative status with the UN ECOSOC, and World Council of Psychotherapy. I especially want to thank our distinguished speakers for all joining us uh, today and, and taking time to, to be here with all of you attendees. A quick a few logistical points as we get started today. On this screen, you'll be able to see and hear from all of our panelists. But since this is Zoom webinar, all attendees are in view and listen only mode. And But that being said, we would really love to hear from you today uh, and, and receive all of your wonderful questions towards the end. We'll have a live Q&A. As attendees, please feel free to use the chat function in your webinar, uh, the toolbar um, chat to pose questions for the panelists and we'll hopefully get to all of them. I would also like to mention that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to SPICI's YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. You'll be able to find this video along with many of our past webinars at youtube.com backslash SPSSI. And to learn more about SPICI, please visit our website at www.spssi.org. And now I'm really pleased to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Linda Silka. Dr. Silka is SPICI's incoming president and a senior fellow at the Senator George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions and Professor Emerita of the School of Economics at the University of Maine. Previously, she was a faculty member with the University of Massachusetts Lowell and directed the Center for Family, Work, Community and served as special assistant to the UML Provost for Community Outreach and Partnerships. A social and community psychologist by training, most of her work has focused on building community university partnerships, including at the international level. Those include the, I, the NIEH funded South, Southeast Asian Environmental Justice Partnership and the New Ventures Partnership. The US HUD founded Community Outreach Partner Partnership Center and Diverse Healthy Homes Initiative and the Center for, for Immigrant and Refugee Community Leadership and Empowerment. She has served as PI on many US federal grants from the, from, namely from the NIH, the NSF, uh, HUD, the EPA, and the Department of Education. In the area of climate change, she has worked numerous times at the state level toward building community resilience. 
Dr. Silko recently co-led the Mitchell Center's equity assessment from, from the State of Maine Climate Council to evaluate how the plan addresses climate change issues and is also addressing equity issues. Thank you, Dr. Silka, and I'll turn it over to you. Anila, thank you very much. Um, I know all of us here are looking forward very much to learning from each other and thinking about how we can work together. Um, and this is a very exciting um, panel that has been put together to, to um, talk about and think about moving beyond the rhetoric of leaving no one behind. We all know how important that is. And we, we work together to think about issues in terms of even when we have these, these, these great goals, how do we know if they're working? How do we know if we're going to uh, be at a different place, say five years from now or 10 years from now? And um, in this panel, we have the people who can help us get there and help us know that. Um, and so the, um, the leaders today, the international leaders who will be leading us and talking to us are, are really going to help us think across um, the 17 sustainability development goals um, and how do we leave no one behind? And how do we make sure, how do we have data um, that will help us see if we're protecting uh, and fulfilling human rights for all um, and end racial, gender, and other forms of discrimination that are prohibited by international law. We all know that's hard. It's not gonna happen overnight, but it's going to happen when we all work together. And that's why it's so important that we have everyone here today to help us with this roadmap, to think about um, how research can be an important part of uh, figuring out what, what we need to do. And so we'll hear from each speaker in turn. They'll have um, um, about 12 minutes each, uh, uh, perhaps a little more, um, to, to talk to us and, um, and tell us about their strength in this area and their knowledge of what we need to do. And I hope that that everybody who's on the line that you happen to have a notebook with you that you can write down what you hear because you're going to hear so much that if you're like me you're going to forget a lot of it and um, so it's just it's going to be great and hopefully this is just the beginning of all of us uh, talking to each other and learning from each other so each uh, speaker will talk in turn and um, what I'm going to do before each person is introduce them and then they'll talk, uh, then the next leader um, will be introduced and, and talk. And then when everyone has, has shared with us some ideas, we'll have time for a conversation with you in the audience and with the people whose uh, faces you can see on the screen. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. Um, and uh, do use the chat, uh, feel free to uh, put things in, as I say, also write down things. And I really encourage you too to think about two or three people in your life that you're gonna tell about what you learned today and what we should all be doing together. So think about that. Um, so our first speaker will be um, Her Excellency Ambassador Maritza Chen, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the UN. Um, she brings so many skills. Uh, Ambassador Chan is an international peace and security expert and global feminist activist. With decades of experience and uh, as a professional speechwriter and arms control, excuse me, negotiator, Ambassador Chan's platform revolves around arm control, gender, security, the rule of law, um, and uh, anti-impunity uh, reform. She served in more roles than we could go through all day today. Uh, but we're very looking, very much looking forward to hearing from you now, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. And thank you to our participants for being up so early. And I hope that the conversation we'll have today will be fruitful and results oriented. At the outset, we'd like to thank the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues for organizing this event. Let me also acknowledge the presence of my colleague, Ambassador Mohonga of South Africa, 
Dr. Sherpa, Vice Chair of the CERT Committee, and Dr. Windler from the Central U European University. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event along such di a distinguished panel. Costa Rica is proud to be a pluralistic, multi-ethnic, and pluricultural country. Like much of Latin America, Costa Rica has a rich, diverse population, fusing indigenous, African, Middle Eastern, European, and other cultural and ancestral lineages. The list goes on. For example, our Chinese Costa Rican population, of which yours truly is a proud member, is one of many in Chinese communities in Latin America. Costa Rica was also proud to welcome refugees fleeing persecution and civil war in their home countries and the diversity they brought to our communities. In Costa Rica, we know that each new language is spoken, each new background celebrated, each new culture introduced makes our country all the more rich. Costa Rica is also a pr the proud home of a prominent Afro-Caribbean population, a group that currently tallies at 8% of our national population, a figure which has increased in user recent years as a result of, among other factors, self-identification. The Afro-Costa Rican population is a celebrated cornerstone of our national culture and history, and we are very proud of our Africa Afro-Caribbean roots. However, Costa Rica does not turn a blind eye to the worldwide and systemic disparities that people of African descent face. These are now aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it be through access to education, health, nutrition, housing, employment, social protection and care, human security, or the possibility of living a life free of violence or participating equally in civic affairs. Tragically, being born of African descent makes a child 2.5 times as likely that a child will be poor. As a study by the AMFA demonstrate, people of African descent also suffer from multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination affecting specific fundamental rights for women and girls, such as the right to life and to sexual and reproductive health as outlined in SDG 5. Costa Rica urges that much more needs to be done at the international, regional and national level to eliminate racism and uphold the human rights of people of African descent. With that in mind, we would like to raise three following points. First, we cannot stress enough the fundamental importance of disaggregated data. If we know that people of African descent face disproportionate hurdles in many facets of social and economic life, we need targeted policies to support them. We appreciate the commitment of the UN to give visibility to the people of African descent in the context of the international decade of, for Afro-descendants and call on the international community to redouble efforts to collect data that reflect the lived realities of African diasporas around the world. Second, we must guarantee spaces for the participation of Afro-descendant populations and their organizations, and particularly give the floor to women and youth of African descent. Costa Rica firmly believes that the creation of the permanent forum of people of African descent will strategically contribute to redressing the historical injustice and intersecting forms of discrimination that they face. Additionally, if the SDGs and the UN Charter call for gender and racial equality, one of the most obvious places to do so is within these organizations' leadership. This is not just the, molar, the morally thing to do, this is the smarter policymaking. 
We have all seen by now the making policies without having the voices of those who live with lived experience does not work. Diversity means diversity of mind, ideas and approaches, which allows teams to find a solution that takes into account multiple angles of the problem and generating solutions that are stronger, well-rounded and optimized. This creates the ideal environment for collaboration, innovation, problem solving, in other words, the exact skill sets that the UN needs. Third, and relatably, Costa Rica stresses the importance of strong, inclusive institutions and in supporting of our African Afro-descended communities and all of our constituents alike for SDG 16. In Costa Rica, thought our roots may be diverse and divergent, we are united as a human rights focused, peace seeking, environmentally conscious and, the, and democratically minded nation. These attributes are what make protecting our diversity possible. For example, in Costa Rica, the celebration of cultural diversity in our political constitution deepened our understanding of our diverse origins, embraced them as an integral part feature of our society and develop normative frameworks, national politics, public perceptions, and international compacts that tailor support to different groups. Regrettably, we know that all countries, big or small, no matter that development status, endure some form of social stratification at group's expense, whether by gender, ethnicity, race, language, religion, or other factor. Effective institutions, regulations, and policies to counteract these harmful legacies and introduce equity rather than just equality are key to reaching the ideals of the SDGs. Without racial and ethnic equality, there will be no govern governable societies and without full and equal citizenship, there is no sustainable development. While racism and racial discrimination urge us to do more, we're hopeful of the global momentum created by the youth in many corners of the world who are boldly stating that racism is a crime, that racial discrimination and violence cannot be tolerated and that democracy that relegates citizens to second class status is not a true democracy. We appreciate the work done on this front by the working group of experts on people of African descent and the operational guidelines on the inclusion of people of African descent in the 2030 agenda. And we call upon member states and the UN system to incorporate these these to prioritize people of African descent in obtaining the SDGs. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And Costa Rica looks forward to an honest, results-oriented discussion on how we can better support our African descendant communities. It's high time for concrete action. I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, excuse my, my voice. Um, there's so much um, to think about in terms of um, what you said. And as we go on to uh, the, our next speaker, I just want to highlight one of the many points that you made. You said, making policy without the voice of people affected doesn't work. And it doesn't. Um, so thank you. Um, our next esteemed uh, speaker is His uh, Excellency Ambassador uh, Zolitsa Mahoba. I'm sorry, I, my pronunciation doesn't quite capture it, but as I get to know you, I'll, I'll work to get better. Um, and before his latest appointment, His Excellency was representative 
um, of the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency to the United, States, United Nations and Director of the um, agency's New York office. Um, His Excellency has served in several senior diplomatic positions uh, both in South Africa and abroad, and from 2010 to 2013, he was South Africa's ambassador to Austria, Slovenia, and Slovakia. Uh, and during uh, this time, he was also South Africa's um, uh, permanent representative to the UN in Vienna. So, uh, Ambassador, we're very much looking forward to uh, your ideas and thoughts for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we would also like to appreciate uh, the organizers for organizing this uh, very important uh, discussion this morning in the context of the HLPF. And I also wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Marisa Chan of Costa Rica. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has again shown that the world is still far from eradicating systemic racism and that this problem exists in many parts of the world. Therefore, a global approach to eradicating systemic racism is important. Thus, we welcome this discussion of locating the problem within the context of the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. South Africa became a democracy in 1994. Since then, our government has instituted various laws and policy frameworks to undo the legacy of the past. Given the duration of the apartheid regime and its unjust laws, this became imperatives, imperative for our successive governments uh, since 1994. We have thus sought to give substantive rights to all South Africans, including the majority who were discriminated against for so long. Despite this, however, we still face the triple challenge of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. Some of the policies that we have en enacted since 1994 include uh, affirmative action, black economic empowerment, and the Employment Equity Act. These are aimed at directly addressing the legacy of the past and ensure that economic opportunities are extended to all South Africans. Thus, we also seek to ensure that quality education, healthcare, and housing are accessible by all. As we all know, a character of systemic racism is that the rights of one group are put above all those of others. This is what democratic governments in South Africa have sought to reverse since 1994. The protection of human rights broadly in the constitution of South Africa is described as a cornerstone of our democracy. With respect to the essence of SDG 16, the constitution provides, for example, that everyone is equal before the law, that the state may not unfairly discriminate against anyone and must enact legislation to prevent or prohibit unfair discrimination. It also prohibits, it also provides for the right to life and makes clear that everyone has a right to freedom and security. This is, includes the right not to be detained without trial, as well as the right to be free from all forms of violence from either public or private sources. It also includes a number of participatory political rights, including free, fair, and regular elections, as well as labor rights, such as the right to fair labor practices. Additionally, it establishes that everyone has a right to access to information held by the state or that is necessary to protect any other rights so these are some of the provisions of our constitution that we believe are aimed at directly addressing the needs of all South Africans, including the black majority who were oppressed for so many decades under the apartheid system. Given the ways in which the pursuit of SDGs intersects with the protection of human rights, it was worth noting at the outset that South Africa's engagement with international mechanisms designed to, to safeguard human rights has also been a pivotal part of our story. South Africa has undergone three cycles of the universal peer review of the Human Rights Council in 2008, uh, 2012, and 2017, and taken an active role in the review of other states. Since 2003, 
we have extended a standing invitation to all UN special procedures and mandate holders. And the last uh, visit was in December 2015 by the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. We believe that we are one of a few, a few countries that have extended this uh, standing invitation to UN special procedures. Uh, of the nine international core human rights treaties, South Africa has ratified seven. It has most recently been reviewed by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. To give an impression of the aggregate impact of these engagements, the Danish Institute for Human Rights has recently put together a compilation of special procedure recommendations, treaty board observations, and universal periodic review recommendations as they relate to SDGs. That database identifies 18 special procedure recommendations, 17 treaty board observations, and 64 UPR recommendations that pertain directly or jointly to SDG 16. Now, uh, moving uh, to another point, we are alarmed that despite efforts by the international community, contemporary forms of racism still appear to be on the ascendancy. Racism and related discrimination have been gaining ground. In many ways, contemporary forms and manifestations of racism and xenophobia strive to regain political, moral, or even legal recognition, including through the platforms of some political parties and organizations. And this is sometimes also aided by the misuse of modern communication technologies, such as the internet and social media platforms. As I come towards the conclusion, I wish to indicate that 2021 marks the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Deppen Declaration and Program of Action, the most comprehensive program for combating racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. The TDPA remains a profound milestone in articulating the harms of racism and racial discrimination, both historically and in the present, with an important emphasis on the structural forms of racism and racial discrimination that to this day require our urgent attention. This blueprint, we believe, must be central to contemporary efforts to combat racism, xenophobia, and related intolerance. Its guidance is relevant for long-term global initiatives, such as the implementation of the SDGs, and also for emergency responses, such as the, the international efforts to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. We believe that the full and effective implementation of the TTPA remains central towards international efforts at eliminating racism. It is important that we work together to rid the world of the pernicious evil of racism so that we may all live in peace, dignity, and opportunity. In this regard, the fight against racism requires all of us to make a collective commitment as we celebrate this 20th anniversary of the DTPA in September on the margins of the UNGA 76 High Level Week. In conclusion, we should remember that laws to fight racism can only go so far. We also need social systems and individuals to change. I thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Um, so many points for us to, uh, to be thinking about as we go forward. The, um, uh, just a few of them that were mentioned, um, impacts of racism on healthcare, on education, on housing, and we need to think about them not as independent, but as integrated. Um, uh, that everyone has the right to information, that information shouldn't belong just to um, a few groups, but it should belong to everyone. Um, and that, that we should all be alarmed uh, that forms of racism are on the increase, um, uh, aided in part by new social media, the things that were supposed to help us create a more equitable world, in fact, maybe having the opposite kind of effect. Um, and the structural forms of racism um, are um, increasing. Um, and to change all this requires all of us uh, to be involved. Um, it 
requires all of us to uh, be doing things that, and that laws can only do so much important as they are. We also need to be thinking about what we can do. Um, and so um, we very much appreciate those points to help us think about uh, these issues. And um, we'll come back to many of them as we get into our, our detailed discussion uh, of these important points. Um, we now have uh, the good fortune to hear from um, another speaker who's going to bring ideas to us, and that is Dr. Shepard, um, uh, and she's on the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, and Dr. Shepard is a graduate of the University of West Indies. Um, and the University of Cambridge. She's a professor emerita of social history. Uh, she's a director of the Center for Reparation Research there, a published author of seven books. You heard me right, seven. <laughs> um, a radio host and scholar activist, especially in the areas of women's rights, human rights, and reparatory justice. Um, she's the uh, immediate past director of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. Um, and at um, the UN, she played a role in helping to implement the UN International Year of the People of African Descent and overseeing the drafting of a program of activities. So we are very fortunate to be able to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, conveners, and organizers. Greetings. The theme for this panel is timely because the murder of George Floyd on Africa Day, May 25, 2020, and the globalization of the Black Lives Matter campaign that followed in its wake has shaken us all to the core and made us realize that so much work needs to be done at the national, regional, and international levels to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, eliminate systemic racism and move beyond the rhetoric of leaving no one behind. We admit, of course, that George Floyd's murder is just one in a long line of violations of black bodies that intensified with African enslavement, but lived on through Jim Crow in the United States in racial apartheid in other countries like South Africa and even the Caribbean and other systems based on anti-black discrimination which appeared to have no end in sight because of the philosophy that holds one race superior and another inferior. Indeed, when I think of what happened to George Floyd and the many before him and after him, my mind goes back to Marlon James's The Book of Night Women to reflect on how Lilith don't want to accept things as them be like a good Negro because Lilith have a quilt on her back from her beatings in the context of a bigger quilt a patchwork of Negro bones that reach from Africa to the West Indies. I visualized Homer's washboard back, how after death, she reborn herself as a struggle, a struggle that descendants must carry on as a sacred trust. We have a responsibility as human rights defenders to add our voices and direct our energies towards this struggle and call on member states and other stakeholders to integrate the elimination of systemic racism and racial stroke ethnic discrimination in their implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Paragraph 23 of the report by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Her Excellency Michelle Bachelet, released by OHCHR on 28 June 21 states that member states should seize opportunities to advance the anti-racism agenda, prioritize attaining racial equity in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and ensure that people of African descent are not left behind. It is time to intensify the implementation because in 2015, 195 states agreed with the United Nations that they can change the world for the better. What better way to do this than by working towards SDG 1 and poverty in all its forms everywhere and SDG 10, reduce inequality within and among countries, which are linked because the fulfillment of most of the other goals depends on states being in a better economic situation to end hunger and or reduce inequality and meet the social and physical infrastructural needs of their populations, for example, in health and education. 
I use this opportunity to emphasize the fact that my region, the Caribbean, has been focusing on ending poverty in all its forms and reducing inequality within each member state long before these imperatives were fashioned as SDGs, whether one or 10. However, despite concerted efforts, especially since the 1960s, when some states embarked on the path to political independence, centuries of exploitation by some European powers has left states independent or non-independent to be unable to end poverty, to end hunger among vulnerable populations, which means that the dream of ending inequality is still unfulfilled. Admittedly, at the national level, more can be done as long as there is a post-colonial agenda that places a premium on equality. In some cases, pro-colonialism causes lack of enough commitment to end discrimination. At the same time, having extracted the resources of the region for 400 years, the colonial powers left the region on and underdeveloped. That underdevelopment is seen even more starkly today as the Caribbean battles the COVID-19, the pandemic that is increasing the poverty in the region. Yet viruses are in themselves neutral. They slip into our societies without motives or agendas. What we are seeing playing out across the Caribbean right now is less the effects of the coronavirus and more the outcome of centuries of intentional exploitation and underdevelopment. Imperial powers in Europe enriched themselves of the Caribbean for centuries and then left us to grapple with the dilapidated infrastructure, asymmetrical economies, and the non-existent safety nets that they left behind. These colonial legacies have made the region extremely vulnerable to the kind of external macroeconomic shocks produced by the coronavirus. In the words of the late historian Eric Williams, former prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, the West Indies are in the position of an orange. The British have sucked it dry and their sole concern today is that they should not slip and get damaged on the peel. The point is that the fulfillment of SDG 1 and SDG 10, which I uh, selected, cannot be so neatly separated into actions at the national, regional and international levels. Colonialism and its legacies have created socioeconomic crises that cannot be solved by nation states alone but require the input of the international community, the participation of states that are responsible for the um, impoverishment of the global South. In other words, former colonizing states must right the wrongs of the past. In all nations of the Caribbean, the call is for the relevant states to undertake a process of education around colonialism at the national level, apologize for conquest, colonization, slavery, and apartheid, and engage in a process of repatriate justice. Indeed, the High Commissioner's report also identifies long overdue, the long overdue need to confront the legacies of enslavement, the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans and colonialism and to seek repatriate justice. The CARICOM states have developed a 10 point plan for repatriate justice in the form of a development plan. The ninth point on this plan is technology transfer, which can be located within the right to development framework. Number 10 is debt cancellation on the basis that the Caribbean governments that emerge from slavery and colonialism have inherited the massive crisis of community poverty and institutional unpreparedness for development. The pressure of development has driven governments to carry the burden of public employment and social policies designed to confront colonial legacies. So to conclude, the United Nations and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have undertaken an extraordinary responsibility and assumed an important role in the development of standards of justice for people, including people of African descent. Standards that are internationally and nationally recognized and vital to the respect and protection of human rights. Among the most well-known standards are those laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which enshrines the key principles of equality. National constitutions, human rights institutions, charters of fundamental rights and other protocols recognize many of these norms and standards, but implementation depends on the degree to which states are committed to eliminating the legacies of centuries of colonialism to which Africans in the, in the diaspora were subjected and even more committed 
for the restoration of their rights and dignity. The Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has maintained since its inception a keen focus on ensuring the respect and protection of all rights and freedoms of all people and a specific mandate for particularly vulnerable groups. Article one of the ICERD in fact sets out the prohibited grounds of racial discrimination. We can argue about whether or not any separate races exist, whether race is not just a social construct. The fact is that the racism exists and we need to fight collectively against it. The Durban Declaration and Program of Action and the Program of Activities for the International Decade for People of African Descent also formulate recommendations to combat discrimination against Africans and people of African descent, including through reparation. So in the end, access to fair and equitable justice is about respect. It's about non-discrimination and dignity for the human person. As Haile Selassie I said on the question of racial discrimination, the Addis Ababa conference taught to those who will learn this further lesson, that until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, until they are no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, until the color of a person's skin is of no more significance than the color of his or her eyes, until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regard to race, until that day, the dream of lasting peace and world citizenship and the rule of international morality will remain but a fleeting illusion to be pursued, but never attained. Thank you so much. Dr. Shepard, that was just um, so important. So many, um, again, so many important points for us uh, to think about um, as, we, as we talk again and again together about um, uh, moving beyond the rhetoric of leaving no one behind. In just a few, there were so many points, I couldn't catch them all, uh, but um, important points like we should be shame to the core about what's going on now and what's still going on. Um, and that we really have a sacred trust um, to address and it's a tremendous challenge. Um, uh, the, sustainable, the sustainable development goals provide an opportunity for us to think about some of these issues and how to advance those goals and that it's time to intensify action. And, uh, two slides that really help us, we should imprint those on our heads <laughs> to help us think about them. So um, uh, Dr. Uh, Shepard pointed out um, sustainable development goals one in 10 um, out of 17 and some of the things that, why they're important and what needs to be done. And also the 10 point action plan and how we would go about doing some of the things together that need to be done. Um, and uh, she pointed out, of course, that the dream of ending inequality still has not met uh, and that centuries of exploitation continue to have their impact. And when we look at something like COVID, shocks have more of an effect when we have unfair systems and that we need to be very much thinking about that and the vulnerability to shocks um, and how we all need to come up together to strategies um, that um, need to be uh, followed and that are important. Um, I didn't even begin to capture all of the important points that were there, but the very important points for, um, for us to, um, to think about and that as we all come together and talk after our next uh, speaker, there's so much for us to think about in terms of the development goals and how can information help us see if we're stuck or we're making the progress that we need to make. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Winkler, who's incoming associate professor in international human rights law at the Central European University in Vienna, Austria. Dr. Winkler, um, is, uh, was previously on the faculty of the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University. Her research focuses on socioeconomic rights, um, substantive equality, and sustainable development. Uh, it bridges institutional protection and socio-cultural dimensions of human rights, global policy, 
grassroots movements and critical reflection with and practical application. And um, her uh, books um, have been very important in terms of uh, making points about the human right to water, the handbook on critical menstruation studies and an edited volume on sustainable development goals. So Dr. Wakeler, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much uh, for a very kind introduction. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, and really everyone who's committed to eliminating racism and discrimination. Um, I'm delighted to, to be here today. So many thanks to uh, SPICI, as I learned now the way it's pronounced, um, and the uh, permanent mission of, of Costa Rica for the kind invitation. And I'm really glad to, to see that, uh, while broadly speaking, goal 10 on reducing inequalities and the commitment to, to leave no one behind really continue to be central to the agenda of the high level political forum. And at the same time, I have to say that I'm really disappointed that we still need, now that we're in 2021, six years after the adoption of the SDGs, that we still need events like this one where we have calls to move beyond the rhetoric. So this is not a criticism of your event, uh, more a criticism of the, of the global community in, in general. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is really to take a global perspective and to speak about the power of data, uh, picking up on what your, your excellently call, uh, called the, the power of disaggregated data and the power of indicators in the SDG framework. Um, so let me take a step back to, to the time that the SDGs were, were negotiated. Um, so at the time I was working with the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. Uh, one of those special procedures mandate that you actually from South Africa mentioned. And the, the development and negotiation of the sustainable development agenda was a central part of, of our work. Um, in particular, obviously, as it related to human rights advocacy and integrating human rights in the context of the SDGs. And in particular, in relation to, to reducing inequalities. Um, so one part of our work was, was related to negotiations at the political level, jointly with many other human rights advocates, many other sp uh, special procedures, and really advocating for a goal that would be focused on reducing inequalities. Um, another part of our work, very much related but at a different level, was much more technically focused. Um, so that was focused on really looking at, well, how do we monitor inequalities? How do we monitor the reduction in disparities? How do we improve indicators? And that was very much focused on, on water and sanitation. Now, I would say that to some extent, we, we were successful in working on both of these areas. When we look at the sustainable development agenda, it looks great. I mean, we have goal 10 on reducing inequalities. We have the central commitment uh, to, to leave no one behind. Looking at data, we even have a target on improving monitoring and collecting more disaggregated data in, in target 17.18. Similarly, at the technical level, we, we know what we need to do. We have the technical solutions. We know how to monitor the reduction of inequalities. And we have some examples where, where this is actually happening. But now um, there's a big but. Where, where we failed as global community is in bringing the two together. We failed at that point where the technical turns political and we fail to actually integrate the monitoring of inequalities, the monitoring of reduction in disparities. Um, we fail to really integrate that into, into the SDG agenda. Um, we don't have the monitoring of inequalities to the extent that we need it. We don't have the disaggregated indicators in the SDG agenda. Um, and that obviously, I would say, is a question of, of political will. Because of course, the litmus test for the SDGs 
and whether they will truly leave no one behind is not in the aspirational language of the SDGs, um, but it's really whether this language translates into the implementation of the goals of the basis of equality and non-discrimination. And why do I think that monitoring plays such an important role? And why do I keep talking about, about indicators? Because we can think of indicators as metrics that are pegged to specific targets. And indicators have the power to concentrate our effort and attention. And as technical as they, as they may seem, data indicators and disaggregation play a really important role in facilitating and enabling the adoption of measures to ensure the reduction in inequality and ensure reductions in racism. Because every information system, every piece of data that we have renders certain aspects of the world visible. And in rendering some aspects visible, it makes others recede into the background. So our data sets highlight some things, but not others. And in that way, monitoring can serve as a really important accountability tool. And by collecting data and analyzing disparities, um, we can use data as a tool for accountability to call on policymakers, to put pressure on policymakers, uh, to redress the impacts of, of marginalization um, and discrimination that are so deeply rooted in, in colonialism and so many other factors. So the framing of indicators and the disaggregation they call for, they're not just technical details. They have significant influence on what data is being gathered. And as a result, they have significant influence on what matters in the implementation of the SDG agenda. And to date, um, I really hope that that will change soon. Racial and ethnic variables have largely been ignored in SDG monitoring, despite the fact, as we all know, that racial and ethnic discrimination are among the most prevalent and persistent forms of, of discrimination. Um, but as we already heard in terms of participation, all too often communities that are marginalized are not part of monitoring efforts. Uh, they're excluded from data gathering. They're rendered invisible. They recede into the background um, in the context of SDG monitoring. And in an analysis that I did jointly with um, Professor Meg Satterswaite at NYU, we looked into well, what's actually included in the SDG indicators. And we found that there is not enough, um, but there is a fair share of disaggregation by sex, um, some disaggregation by age, by disability status. Uh, I don't want to say we are where we need to be, but there is some disaggregation. But when we look at race and ethnicity, we get to the point where it's rather distressing um, because we have the targets, we have the target language, looking back to the aspirational language that calls very, very explicitly for looking at race and ethnicity and so many other factors. But when we get to that level of indicators, what's actually being monitored, what determines what data we have, what information we have, there's not a single indicator that calls explicitly for disaggregation by race and ethnicity. Um, not one. There are a couple of indicators uh, that I should mention that look at indigenous status, that look at key populations in the context of HIV AIDS, uh, that look at the most disadvantaged population, population groups, poor and vulnerable groups, but you can already hear how vague um, those terms are. And perhaps the most striking, striking as, as in disappointing, um, is uh, target 10.2, which is one of the targets associated with the goal on reducing inequalities. So very much at the core of what we are discussing today. Um, so the target language is really robust. It calls for empowering and promoting the social, economic and political inclusion of all 
irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion, or economic or other status. So we have a whole list of those prohibited grounds of discrimination. When you move to the indicator though, um, it calls for monitoring the proportion of people living below 50% of median income. So it's entirely reduced to looking at income, not political and social inclusion. And then it calls for disaggregation by age, sex, and persons with disabilities. So disturbingly in that translation from the target to the indicators, we lost a few crucial dimensions. And I would say unsurprisingly, those dimensions are about race, ethnicity, social origin, and so on. And that means there won't be any data collected in the SDG framework on, on these dimensions. We won't learn in the context of the SDGs um, anything about discrimination on the basis of race and ethnicity. And those dimensions will recede into the background. And given how explicit the target language is, I don't think we can consider this an oversight. Um, it is, this omission is a decision to treat these stratifiers differently by excluding them. And I would argue that the reasons for this exclusion are likely to lie in the power of data, because if we were to actually measure those dimensions, we would call attention to historic and ongoing injustices uh, that those in power would prefer not to see highlighted. So the very processes of marginalization and power structures that con continue to be in evidence in the SDG framework itself, um, and a focus on groups that are marginalized by race, caste, ethnicity, indigenous status, relates to, to the dimensions that are perceived as inescapably political, that are so often described euphemistically as politically sensitive, um, which explains that we are rejecting calls to, to focus on these stratifiers. So I think now the question is, can we do better? Um, we definitely could if we wanted to. Um, at a technical level, monitoring these kinds of inequalities is certainly possible. One example is the, the World Inequality Database on Education uh, that I would urge all of you to, to have a look at, which is based on household survey data that is widely available and reports inequalities on a whole range range of different prohibited grounds of, of discrimination, including ethnicity and religion, in addition to, to many others. And similarly, in the context of water and sanitation, the sector that I'm most familiar with, we also see some reporting on language, uh, ethnicity, religion, and how belonging to particular groups influences disparities and how these are reduced over time. So we certainly need to collect more and better data, but there's also a lot we could do with the data that already exists, uh, in particular through, through household surveys. Now, I think the other question is, are we likely to do better? Um, and there, I'm not sure whether I'm that, I'm that optimistic. Um, the, the analysis that um, I did with Professor, Professor Featherthwaite is a few years old, so in preparation for, for today, I, I did not redo the whole analysis, I have to admit, but I had a look at some of the more, more recent developments. And of course, there are opportunities to, to revise, refine, develop indicators. The interagency group and interagency and expert group on sustainable development indicators is ongoing. Uh, there are lots of opportunities to make changes to, to the indicator framework. Uh, there is a work stream on data disaggregation. Um, so the opportunities exist, but there's still no indicator that explicitly calls for disaggregation on race and ethnicity. And when I look at some of the more recent changes in the indicator framework, one of the indicators I mentioned earlier is indicator 1.B1, uh, which looked at the proportion of government spending to sectors that disproportionately benefit 
uh, and it called for looking at women, the poor and vulnerable groups, however we want to understand that. And now in the most recent reiteration, that indicator has been reduced to pro-poor public spending. So rather than expanding this aggregation, we lost some of those dimensions and the indicators have become even more limited. So to conclude, we have the general commitment in the SDGs. We have the technical solutions to make it possible. We can disaggregate data. We have the processes in place to making such refinements and adopting new proposals. So what we need now is to really make use of these solutions and processes to ensure that leave no one behind is more than just rhetoric. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, bringing together all of these ideas, it's just uh, so important. Um, as, <clears throat> as it started out, uh, Dr. Winkler uh, started out that she points out being disappointed that six years later, we still need calls about the importance of data that, um, and the power of disaggregated data. The data is really um, uh, important if we're going to monitor inequality and do something about um, inequality. Um, and it needs to be effective data. And she points out that at the technical level, we know what to do. Uh, and then she said, but, and this is a big but, um, that the, in terms of the technical turning political, we failed. So it, in the cases where we have data, we haven't used it um, effectively for it to make the difference that it is intended to make. And she points out also um, why monitoring plays such an important role, why we need to have it as an important piece of, of what we're doing. Um, that um, for one thing that it does is it concentrates our attention and also that it renders aspects of the world visible that we are able to see things that we think may be going on but they become much more um, salient when we see the data and um, it can be a tool, data can be a tool for accountability in very important ways. And that we really need to think about how we frame data, not that it's not just technical information, like my parents would say, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, uh, but understanding um, uh, why it matters. And also we need to understand um, who is creating the data and making sure that everyone has access to the data and that groups aren't marginalized also in terms of data. Um, she, she talked about race and ethnicity indicators, what's measured, um, what's striking and disappointing in terms of the target language that's used. And when you look at how the different indicators are translated and how we go from targets to indicators and helps us think about an important question is, can we do better? Can we uh, do a lot more with data than we have? and use it as a tool that helps us in, in, in this area. So again, thank you so much um, for all of this information that's really helpful across all of, all of um, our very talented speakers in terms of thinking about these issues. And we wanna turn now to um, hearing about people's thoughts and questions. Um, we'd especially like to begin with the speakers with the panel, if you have some thoughts as you think about each of your perspectives coming together, what you think needs to be done together um, or what um, uh, should be issues that are really important that become even more salient to you as you listen to what people have to say. And also the groups that supported uh, this coming together today, people who are um, representing those groups. If you also want to raise some questions, that would be, be great. And we also have some questions uh, in the chat. So who wants to go first? Don't all jump at once. Yes. Good morning and thanks. 
uh, to Your Excellency uh, Chan and to um, Mabongo, uh, also to uh, Dr. Zwinkler, and um, I'm getting only half the name, I'm so sorry. Uh, Dr. Vernine, I cannot get the other half of your name, I'm sorry. Uh, I think the presentations were really um, stellar, and uh, I do echo what Dr. Winkler has said. It is distressing that six years later, or uh, I count a little bit longer than that, we're still having this conversation about uh, what to do about race and racial inequalities. Um, I take your point, Dr. Winkler, that um, the excuse or the, the comment that there is a political uh, issues that are involved here and why things don't get done is, is, is a little distressing also. Um, but I, I wonder if I could ask our, our missions if when thinking about all the wonderful work that you have done in your countries, what were or what was perhaps one of the more salient barriers to overcoming some of the opposition to eroding the racial and ethnic discrimination that you had in your countries. I think your work, particularly in Costa Rica and in South Africa are, are stellar and um, are really beacons for the rest of the world, um, but they probably face the same obstacles. And I wonder if you might be willing to uh, identify one or two of those and how you managed to overcome those. Great question. Uh, if I may. Go for it. Yes. No, thank you very much. It's a very uh, important question that you have asked. Um, I think the, the issue, as I said in my, in my statement at the end, is that uh, we need to change the social systems and, and attitudes at the end of the day, because laws can, changing laws can only take us uh, only so far, because uh, the attitudes uh, towards racism, in reality, people learn them uh, at home. Um, I mean, in the case of South Africa, we still have uh, uh, young kids who grow up in, um, in, in, in families that still have some tendencies uh, uh, towards uh, racism. So, uh, you know, then it, it, it multiplies. So, uh, so this is the issue about social systems, changing social systems, uh, changing attitudes. And education uh, in South Africa was one of the elements that we, we are using uh, to overcome this, uh, to make sure that uh, everyone buys into the idea of one South Africa, uh, that you know we, we don't have any other home except uh, South Africa, so we have to live together. So I think that education is a, is a key element of the response. It may not be adequate, but it is, it is very important. Uh, so then on the economic front, Again, the, the laws that we, we put into place to ensure that you know, uh, uh, black people are given uh, opportunities in the industry, in corporates, you know, they, were, they were also crucial. And I think that the more you have uh, more people of uh, color in those institutions, you know, then uh, attitudes can, uh, can uh, start uh, to change. So uh, let me stop here. South Africa, of course, is peculiar because the majority of people are black. And they were they are the ones who were, who were oppressed, but at the same time, it's not a, an easy uh, task. We still after uh, since 1994, we are still working on this, so we have not yet uh, reached uh, the, the goal. So yeah, thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Chan. Were you going to? Yes, uh, yeah, sometimes you. we face this, this question, not only when it comes to race or ethnicity, it also when it comes to gender. And, and my response to those questions is that, yes, it has to be by design. It has to be by quotas, it, but also by reframing the discourse around um, women and, and race and ethnicity. Um, it has to be intentional, uh, creating the opportunities for Afro-descendant population to be placed in positions of power. In the case of Costa Rica, we have the first uh, Afro-Caribbean vice president in the history of Costa Rica. 
and it has a meaning. It means something, you know, women see her reflected in high positions of power. So she encouraged other women to, to join, uh, other women of color to join the conversation and to be part of politics because they, are, they used to be excluded. Now we have someone who has reached one of the high echelons of power and it has to be intentional. Uh, it has to be by design. And we may not like that conversation, but we need to have it. And, and our leaders have been wise enough to say, we need to see them incorporated. 8% of the population, it's important. And, and the fact that they, Costa Ricans are self-identifying as Afro-descendants is also key. Um, in the case of the Chinese population, where 1% of the population it's, you know, it's, it's a rich, um, multicultural, multi-ethnic country, but also it's important that by design, we place people that represent the different faces of Costa Rica. And the fact that we were able to incorporate that issue into our political constitution cemented it. So it's set on stone. Costa Rica is a pluri-ethnic, multi multiracial country and and we are you know the faces of Costa Rica represent that I thank you thank you ambassador chain theory uh, thank you very much we have a question um, from the in the chat from Julie Ockham Larson and um, it fits with some of what uh, has been talked about right now it says first of all thank you for your excellent presentations what role do you think schools and educators can play in addressing systemic racism? Um, I think schools are, are at the core of this effort. Um, this is where young minds are, are molded. So I think the, the more, and I, I take the point by, uh, uh, by uh, Marita Chan, uh, about uh, representativeness. We have had also this challenge in South Africa because um, in the history of apartheid, for example, we had um, schools only for white people and they were better resourced. So uh, the more than, way more than uh, those schools that were attended by black people. So with the changes that came in 1994, we started having schools that are mixed, but we still find uh, instances where even the schools that are that are mixed, you find that there's a, there's few uh, black teachers. So that element of representation is an ongoing conversation because black people, black students are now going to the same schools. Uh, so they want to see uh, representativeness. They want to see a, a, a people who look like them uh, teaching in the in these schools. So this is a very important point. I think uh, uh, schools and educators are central to this because also if we change the minds of the young people who come from uh, from uh, families that still exhibit a backward uh, attitudes, then they are able to integrate and, and see uh, students from different backgrounds. So that in itself can help in, uh, in uh, shaping their minds and their outlook in life. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We have... <clears throat> <clears throat> Another question about education that's in the chat, and it says, my name is Krista Edwards, and I'm a school psychology doctoral student at the University of Missouri um, in the United States. My research surrounds radicalized stressors, racialized stressors, and the academic and social emotional outcomes for African-American youth. My question is, how can we use reparations to create a more equitable field for Black youth education? Yes. Yes, I wanted to just pick up on the question of education because I want to add that the text, the content of the textbooks is not only about access, to schooling is also about the content of the textbooks. And the textbooks that we inherited as a, as a colonized space 
did not represent people of African descent, did not represent minorities. So in the post-independence period um, in the Caribbean, we have been spending a lot of time rewriting and, uh, you know, WR writing, WRIT, um, I can't even spell writing, WRITING to write RIGHT. So that's our project, writing to write and uh, reshaping the content of education. It's also about teacher training. But this can't happen only in one part of the world. We have to see the interconnectedness between the attitudes of you know, systemic racism and how that is played out and the education system in all of our countries. So at the committee level of the CERD, we always ask states about the content of education and the access to that content by all children. Because if the children are not educated properly, then it represents and, and it perpetuates. I also want to say that religious type education in some cases feeds you know, um, antisocial behaviors in our society like uh, patriarchal ideology, sexism, because there's an intersectionality um, that we have to be aware of. The other thing is that even if the population is, you know, ethnically unbalanced, meaning that in our region, in the Caribbean, over 90% of the people are of African descent or Africans, but it still needs an intentional attack on the content and access. History, education, I think is one of the best means of teaching tolerance, teaching what happened in the past, uh, learning from the past to go forward. But history, if history is not a mandatory subject in, at all levels of the education system, then I don't think that that is gonna serve us well. So I wanted to just jump in on that. Excellent. If I can add on that one, on the textbooks, uh, in South Africa, a few years ago, we saw uh, a lot of uh, student uh, activism and uh, their rallying cry was actually the decolonization of education. So they were essentially talking about uh, textbooks. What are we being taught? Uh, how can we decolonize this so that it reflects uh, Africa? It reflects uh, South Africa. We do not only have textbooks in universities that are, are having an American or European feel uh, to them. So this again is an important, and this was an initiative that grew organically, started by students themselves. So we, so it shows that um, student uh, activism can lead, and now many of the universities in South Africa are actually being proactive. They are undergoing this process of decolonization of um, of uh, of the of the, the schools, the textbook, the teaching, and this is where again the point of representations comes in. They are trying to recruit more uh, black professors, black teachers, so that uh, black uh, students can also see these uh, professors and uh, as they alongside the decolonization of education. If I may, I would like to be excused at this moment, but again to thank you very much for this thank because you. I do have to walk to another meeting that starts at nine. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Anne, you had your, um, were you going to say something? Uh, yes. Um, Thank you. I, my name is Koran Okorodudu, and I am a member of the SPICI team at the United Nations. Um, Professor Winkler asked the question, can we do better about the data that we are, are uh, accumulating uh, with the idea that data shows us what needs to be done and by whom. Um, but she was not very optimistic about the fact that we can do better. So I, I, I raised the question again, uh, what needs to be done better in order to have the kind of disaggregated data that would throw light on the issues of racism within the SDGs. So important. 
Dr. Winkler, do you just want to jump in? Yeah. Just jump in. Um, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. I, Go ahead. I think in the end, what it really boils down to is is political will. And I mean, what I was talking about is really, I mean, um, data at the at the global level, and that's kind of the level where where. I, I have to admit I'm not particularly optimistic because we had all the opportunities to, to make that happen. But obviously, I mean, that's just one. I mean, the SDG framework is really just one area where, where this is happening. And when I look at, I mean, so many initiatives at the, at the national level, at the local level, um, and I think, I mean, the representatives we had today from, from South Africa and Costa Rica, I mean, you are showing us how it's being done. And uh, I remember many meetings, I mean, with as representatives from the statistical office in, in South Africa, for instance, um, where we really had those conversations and where uh, we can see, I mean, that at the technical level, I mean, it is absolutely doable, feasible to, to collect data. And I mean, I kind of glossed over some of the challenges given the, the limited time. And obviously there are challenges in terms of uh, data security and privacy and confidentiality and making sure uh, that data, is, data collection is based on the principle of self-identification. So I'm not saying it isn't complicated, but it certainly can can be done and I think yeah so many efforts uh, that are already ongoing show us um, what we can learn from such data and how we can really use this aggregated data as as an accountability tool. Dr. Shepard were you gonna help us understand? Uh, thank you I was just going to say that each year at the CERD when countries come before us for this interactive dialogue this issue of data collection comes up. And the EU countries, I think, are more resistant than, say, the Caribbean and Latin America. We see efforts in Latin America and the Caribbean to collect disaggregated data. Our policy is that, our position is that if you don't know what you're dealing with, you can't, you can't address the problems. If you don't know, if you don't disaggregate the data in terms of, you know, education, who is in school, who is not, um, what ethnic groups um, are disadvantaged, which, one, which ones are better off. But I think this is, this is coming out of our history, of the history of Europe. It's coming out of the world wars and what happened to certain groups of people who, if identified, were um, suffered for it. And therefore, um, whereas you have agencies that funda fundamental rights agency and other you know ngos and so on collecting data this the the Euro some european states are, are still reluctant because they think it's a way that could lead to discrimination we see differently we see it's a way to point out who is being left behind and therefore it will it will allow us to have targeted solutions to correct that situation. It's an ongoing struggle, and I don't think the CERD has won that battle. Uh, we continue. The states have to have, to have the, the notion that they're helping and not disadvantaging people by not collecting data. It's, a, it's an ongoing problem. And COVID-19 is also showing us that we need to know who are the people being affected so that we can target the solutions. But there's resistance still. Thank you so much. We're nearly out of time. Um, it would be great to hear a few words of who are you going to tell about what you heard today, or what are you going to do with 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 what you heard today? So, any thoughts? We're not going to do anything. <laughs> Of course we will. And sure. uh, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, I really want to congratulate the CERD and I mean, all the work you've, you've been doing and uh, well, I hope that you'll continue to, to fight that battle. Um, I mean, I'm originally from Germany and uh, I mean, all the, all the difficulties in, in convincing um, states around collecting that data, I'm well aware. So I hope you'll continue fighting that battle. And I think for all of us to, to take this forward, I think for me, the most obvious once are my are my students 
uh, to to keep talking about all all the issues we we raised today. And I think if all of us do that, then uh, we get to the point where where we can change some of those mindsets. And I think that's not just for not for, not just for students and not just for yes. schools, uh, but really for for everyone. And I mean, at the community level, and really everyone in in society. So seeing such a broad age range today and seeing such diversity on the panel, I think is also really promising. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I this is Koran again. Um, I feel that there's a need to get this the messages of today to member states and to the United Nations. So, Thank you. The question is how, how are we going to do that yes. effectively? Yes. Ambassador James? Um, from today, I want you to know that Costa Rica will continue to champion with chat the creation of the forum, the permanent forum of people of African descent. We have faced resistance, but we are resilient. And we, our commitment to getting this forum rolling is permanent. It's, um, it's there and we'll see the light. I thank you. Thank you. I think I want to say that I'll continue as a member of CERN to champion all the issues that we have spoken about. Remember that recent, just last year, the CERN adopted General Recommendation 36. Please get a hold of it because it's about combating racial profiling among law enforcement officials. It is a critical general recommendation. A Colum the, the, our Colombian colleague started it. He left it in my hands. I did the best I could and the committee worked very hard to ensure that it's now, uh, you know, is there. And so we are also appealing to states and NGO civil society, you know, to uh, come, um, agree to be to come and talk to the CERN so that together we can solve this problem. And as an educator, of course, I take this message everywhere, as as some of you know, because you keep inviting me to talk at these fora. <laughs> Linda, could I could I add just that I think that this forum gives us an opportunity to find new partners in this very difficult struggle. Yes. And I am thrilled uh, as we looked at uh, putting this forum together to learn of Costa Rica's long efforts and of course, South Africa. And I am hoping that we can take this as a springboard to continue working together because it's going to take a number of hands at yes. the table to, to address this problem. So I thank you all very much. And I think this is a great beginning. Yes. Thank you everyone. What an opportunity. Thank you everyone who um, was listening and will use all the ideas. Thank you to everyone who shared ideas with us and um, that we all um, don't stop here. We go forward and it, this could not have happened with all, without all the talented uh, people who really helped us come together. And we all look forward, I'm sure, to continuing to talk to each other. So I believe with that, we're out of time, Anila. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.